We are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Show Must Go On Line. We have two very special guests today, Catherine Allison and Yvonne Stennett. How are y'all doing today? We are great. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you both so much for coming on. I am just so excited to dive deep about cloth and go into all of that. Plus, Catherine, your amazing career. So it, it's so, so wonderful all the way around. But let's first just give a little background on who each of you are. So Yvonne, why don't you tell us, let's start with you. Tell us who sure. you are, kind of like your origin story, if you will. Ah, so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, so uh, Yvonne Stennett, Executive Director of Community League of the Heights, um, my origin story. My origin story with the organization or my origin story with Yvonne? Ooh, can we do both, please? Can we do both? So I am a, a native of Jamaica, West Indies, came to this country when um, back in the 60s and um, have had the pleasure of um being a uh, Harlem and Washington Heights uh, community member. Uh, skipped out of the city for a little while to go away to college. Um, went to a HSBCU college um, and came back and I have been working at Community League of the Heights since the 70s, quite some time. Um, going into over 40 years of being with an organization that I love and cherish. Um, yeah. That is just so wonderful. And I love how both stories kind of just flow right into each other that it would be, we would be missing something if we didn't hear your true origin story and then into going into cloth. And Catherine, I'd love to hear how you got into theater and then take that into how you started working and volunteering with cloth and being on the board. Sure. Um, so I got into theater really seriously when I was in high school. But before then I had met someone in middle school who um, her family was obsessed with musical theater. She gave me like a musical theater mixtape. It had Little Shop, it had Aida, Little Women. I mean like the creep, Les Mis, I mean like creme de la creme. Um, and it was my first introduction into what musical theater was really. Um, and from there, um, my, also, my parents were really great at uh, bringing me to all different types of art. So they would take me to museums. They would take me to see um, Alvin Ailey. They would take me to see The Nutcracker. They would take me. Um, and they were always really keen on making sure that there was people of color always at the forefront, or at least, like, definitely sprinkled in there. They just kind of wanted to provide the message that you can do anything. You don't have to do it yourself. Um, and so it wasn't until maybe around high school that I started taking it really seriously. And I started taking all these after school courses, um, in singing, dancing, acting, you name it. Um, and I decided I wanted to go to college for it. Um, during the time of finding my love for theater, I also was really heavily into politics. So I would do, um, political camps during the summer, <laughs> uh, which is crazy to think about that now. So um, when I was in high school, my mom started working with Community League, as a, uh, Community League of the Heights as a consultant. And I had to do volunteer hours with the high school that I was working with. And I wanted to also work at a place that I really liked and um, Cloth just had this amazing family and really kind of welcomed my mom and me and my family in. And so um, I would work for them after school. My mom would drive me in when she would be doing work for them or um, board meetings or whatever. So I would do like temp work and um, <laughs> spreadsheets. I feel like they handed me stuff that they knew I wouldn't mess up. <laughs> <laughs> now being on the other side, I know like how serious their work is and like definitely don't want to give something to a high school student that they can mess with or something. <laughs> so it's very like, you know, simple stuff. But they also um had these amazing um health festivals, community festivals where they would shut down the whole street and they would pass out free books. There'd be a bounce house, food. Um and so I really enjoyed working that during the summers as well. Um yeah, so that's basically that's like my 
meld of the two. <laughs> yeah, I went to college for musical theater, um, and I was very fortunate. After I about six months after I graduated, I joined the lovely Latin the musical on Broadway. Yeah. On um, Broadway. I, I love this. I love this story so much because they do go like hand in hand once ag again that it's not just, oh, I'm on Broadway. How else can I help? It's like right. we're brought up together. So, but in that same vein, how has being on Broadway and having that new community and, you know, everyone, especially with this upcoming gala that we will talk about, how does that work hand in hand that you can? talk to someone like Tony Award winner, James Monroe Iglehart, and you're within the community and he wants to help out. Yeah, um, I'm so thankful that he has chosen to do this. Um, you know, uh, I would say about maybe like a year into Aladdin, Yvonne kind of, I had been doing, they do a gala every year at Columbia University. Um, and so I sang or I'd be like, hey, like I have, this friend would be really great as a performance piece. And I think it was about a year and a half in, Yvonne, right? That you asked me to be on the board. Oh, maybe about going on two years now, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Two yeah. Two years. yeah. Um, and so I was timid at first <laughs> because I was like, I don't know if I really have anything to provide. <laughs> She was quiet. I thought she was just sitting there soaking it all in. <laughs> um, because, you know, again, cloth touches um, just so much for the community and so many facets of education, housing, um, food insecurity. I mean, the list goes on and on. And I was like, I'm not an expert in any of those things, but I do want to um, help in any way that I can with the expertise that I know. Um, and through that, it was kind of, uh, it was kind of great because I was able to really bring something that uh, was really instrumental in my life to a new group of people uh, and really show the passion I have for that. And I feel like some people are a little surprised <laughs> when I tell them. Um, I guess surprised that I'm on a board, not necessarily um, surprised that I'm, you know, working with Clock. Um, so, you know, when I tell people like James or um, Damon or Ariel um, or any, you know, buddy who's a, in the community of Broadway about it, they're like, oh my gosh, that sounds like an amazing place and I want to learn more. So, um, Clock is a very easy sell because they do so many wonderful things. So, it's hard for people to be like, I can't, I don't know, you know, so. Right. Yeah, which is what makes it so amazing. Yeah, I was very impressed when I was looking through your bio and I saw a board member. I was like, oh, okay. We're not just like, you know, being a volunteer, being someone within it is, is great, but especially being a board member, I think really shows the dedication and the connection to it. And I was also thinking with Washington Heights, and I don't know if this is a bit of a stretch, but the whole uh, in the Heights and the there is this like strong theater community. I know a lot of my theater yeah. friends live in Washington Heights. Now you have a musical based off of it. I mean, I, I'm wearing a Hamilton immigrants. We get the job done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Yvonne, I wanna ask you, has, has there been any, you know, changes or increase in awareness since the musical came out, which I know was, what was it, 2008 when In the Heights came out, but then Hamilton and now Lin-Manuel, who talks about Washington Heights a lot. Like, do you notice any difference with the Broadway community since then? I think what I've, what I've noticed is that the, the community is spoken of much more positively right um the people have been able to understand through the picture much more about the culture the richness of the culture the diversity of people that are that are in the community even the the, the history of the community so it, it's a whole different way of viewing the community the perception for a long time was very pejorative you know but now i think with the it's like almost pulling the screen back and pulling the curtains back and saying no this this is a rich neighborhood. This is this is flowing. It's vital. It's vibrant, you know. And people really do care about each other. They care about the community. 
So I think it's it's kind of reveal the beauty of the community, and and that that is wonderful because um, I think for the people in the community, it's an uplift, right? So they can feel much prouder about their neighborhood, or prouder about their history and their culture. So it, I think it's done a lot to revitalize the communities in many ways. Yeah. I love that term, reveal the beauty. I think that beautifully explains kind of the rich history that y'all have. And even as I was going through your website and seeing the the portion where people could list the the coffee shop or the butcher and, and the community of it all, can you talk about all the different utilities that y'all offer and how it's really a community of people supporting their own? Oh, definitely. I mean, the, the organization does, you know, multiple, um, <clears throat> multiple programs and multiple services for different uh, sectors of the of the community. So we work a lot with the business community. We have the the neighborhood. It's, it's spread throughout, sprinkled throughout the neighborhood as small businesses, mostly moms and pop stores. Many of them just trying to survive. Um, right not necessarily having the formal business background as larger larger stores so you have to work with them to help them help them think through their business think through how they promote themselves um, so th that's been wonderful to do but then we also do affordable housing we have the food pantry we have a technology center which does workforce development um, so we've had the opportunity to see people in our community at different levels. One of the beautiful things that we were able to accomplish is the creation of our school. It's Community Health Academy of the Heights. And for us, that was a real way of making sure that the legacy of the organization continues on for a very long time, uh, just through the education through the keeping the doors open so that people can learn, grow, and just become more than than um, just you know um, a resident, but be a vital part of society, uh, no matter where they are or where they go. Um, yeah, yeah. I think one of like the beautiful parts of cloth is how it like is able to take care of an entire family's need, which mm -hmm. I feel like there are a lot of organizations that maybe focus on one part of a need, right? Of uh, food insecurity, um, after school education, or just making sure someone is seeing, uh, is taking care of their child while they're still at work or their health care, or trying to um, figure out where they can get a job and their resume or learning English. Or I feel like, yeah. All the family can get all of the, their needs met at one place. Yeah. Um, and it's a huge task to take on. Yeah. yeah. I'm getting a little emotional about it, but it's like, it's, it's, it's a huge task to take on. And the fact that cloth has really um, spread its wings in that way over the 68 years is like incredible. Mm -hmm. I think the, the the way that we see how the, the the agency should and does service the 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 community is that there's a very holistic approach to it, right? Mm -hmm. um, they, we cannot just do the bricks and mortar, right, without looking at the life of the person who's living in those buildings, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have to think about their education, you have to think about their health, you have to think about their social and emotional being. You can't just dichotomize, right? That's not how life is, that's not how we live. Yeah. We touch and every aspect of the world touches us. So if we're not looking out for the the health, if we're not looking out to make sure that there isn't uh, food insecurity and that we, you have a proper education, that the environment is clean, yeah. everything at the end of the day really says whether or not you're growing up, you're developing in a community that is whole, that can support the whole person, the whole being. So we, we strive to make sure that, and, and this is not to say we do um, everything, because one of the things we do is partners. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think we have to realize that, you know, no man is an island, you don't do anything by yourself. And there's a multitude of other people. 
that can be helpful to you. And you have to know when to reach out to others and bring them into the fold so that the service that you give to others can be rich and vital. So we try to make sure we partner with people as well and with our community. Yeah. I, I'm loving this whole conversation because it shows that you do need absolutely everything, but also you can't do everything on your own. And I think those are both such important things, especially right now during a pandemic where people, exactly. you know, where food insecurity that already existed is now heightened and yeah. people can't pay their bills. They can't pay for rent and mm -hmm. all of these things that already were on the surface were already issues. Now it's like, well, hold on, we really need some help. So can you talk about that change from what, what happened in, you know, January, February versus then March and now into November? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I think one of the, the best, um, you know, we, we did a lot of pivoting and a lot of changing in all of our programs. But I think one of the most significant uh, things that we did was having to deal with food insecurity. We've been operating a pantry for many years. Um, I've been there since the 70s. So in the 80s, we actually started the food pantry. Um, and, you know, we would serve two days a week, 250 people a day. But as soon as the pandemic hit, um, we knew that this was gonna be one of the most important things that we could do is to make sure that people could eat, right? Um, so immediately we went into, I don't know, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth gear and just everything just kicked in. And we started seeing people come um, in droves. We ramped up from two days a week to four days a week. We were seeing upwards of 2,400 people a week. Um, and people weren't just coming because of greed. They were coming because of need. They would be there starting at five o'clock in the morning, even though the doors didn't open till nine. The, the lines went completely down the block, around the avenue, and up the next block. It was just, it was just amazing. And when you would be, I mean, I'm getting emotional, but when you would be outside with them, sure, there was gratitude, but there was also fear. Mm. Right? People were fearful to come out, but they needed so much that they had to come out. And you saw everyone, you saw the young, the old, you saw the employed, the unemployed, uh, which uh, that grew quite a lot in our in our community as well. Um, but I was also grateful for the volunteers because they put their lives on the line and really found the divine in themselves to come out and help people. And I, I just think that that's just awesome when we can not worry so much about ourselves, but get ourselves out of the way so we can help others. And that, that was just magnificent. But that, and that's still ongoing. We're still doing the pantry. Uh, I think that's gonna go on for quite some time. I don't see it going away because of unemployment, because the resurgence of COVID, because of all of the things that are happening. I think that's gonna continue for a while. But that, that was really, really humbling to, to, to see that and to be a part of that. It, it still humbles me every time I think of it. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, also the swiftness of how all of these after school programs that um, <clears throat> Cloth has really, they got it together and made sure it was online for all of these young kids to have. And um, I think another thing that we may take for granted is the internet and mm -hmm. having a computer and making sure that you have those things to just the basic necessity to get online, to go to school. And I feel like, you know, cloth had to fulfill that need for their students as well. Um, so yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I just, um, I, I'm glad you mentioned the, the school because, it, you know, getting the young people online and distance learning and all of that was one aspect of it. But one of the other things that we, so immediately was that the isolation oh, yeah. within the first 
two months of being cooped up in their homes, um, having to live differently, having to go to school in, in a closet <laughs> because they didn't have the space within their homes to do it. And, and I kid you not when I say literally sitting in a closet doing their work. Um, wow. The, the emotional stress the the um, sense of um, being cooped up, uh, not being able to go outside, uh, we're causing a lot of emotional um, problems with our young people. So we had to figure out a way online how to give them a venue, a place that some of that could be talked about, could be discussed. Uh, we could identify certain issues that may be needed more help than they were getting at home or could get at home. And we immediately created a socio-emotional uh, online training program. Um, counseling basically is what it is. With some clinicians, um, we reached out to a couple of the universities, brought them together, created a whole curriculum really quickly. And we offered it to teachers, parents, and students. And they all had the ability to get online and whether they wanted to speak about the issues that was facing them on an individual level or if they were parents that were going through the same kind of how do I teach my child? How do I how do I get on the Internet? How do I learn? What, what, what kind of triggers should I be looking for if depression is setting in? And they were able to come together and really use that as a platform to really get all of these issues out and deal with it. And it's always something always triggers something, but we had two students who were at the, the door of, you know, committing suicide. And, and it was not until they were able to talk through that, that we were able to identify them and get them the help that they really needed. But that sense of isolation, that sense of fear, that sense of unknown, because that's that's what a lot of it was. When you don't know if you're going to eat, if you don't know if you can make it through the next day, if you that sense of unknown for our young people is for anyone, but for our young people is really devastating. Um, and so we're trying to continue that program as well, but it worked really good for those first couple of months, did a lot of good. We have over 600 people who participated, um, the teachers, students, and, and parents. So that, that was really, it was mind blowing to listen to some of those sessions as well. Also heartbreaking, um, yeah. but uh, fruitful. Yeah. Well, thank you for, sh for sharing those stories and, really opening up and showing the need that y'all are filling, right? That there, there's this community response to all the difficult things. And I think mental health is being spoken about more, which is a good thing and, and very necessary. And, you know, I, I even tilted my camera a little bit, which might put this out of focus, but uh, my dog here, Slim, like he, his, mental health uh, booster for me. I'm, I'm trying mm -hmm. to think of the right way to say it, but just having him and taking care of him uh, throughout this pandemic has really given me that thing of like, you know, having having someone else to take care of, someone else's mm -hmm. needs. And mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm very grateful to have him. And I could understand uh, if you if you don't have anyone else in your, in your bubble and yeah. um, that that would have been really tough and still is tough but having cloth to kind of be that extra thing. Okay. You don't have this. Here's maybe a training that we can do. Oh, mm -hmm. you, this is something that you didn't know you didn't have. How else can we try to help out? And it's really impressive for an organization that's been around for so long to consistently be revamping and re-innovating and um, just finding what the need of the community is and really filling that. Can you share a little bit more about, the origins of cloth, kind of the earlier days and now how it's changed throughout the years? So um, <clears throat> cloth was created by parents, uh, strong African-American women that lived on 159th Street and a few others sprinkled throughout the community. And their desire and their hope was to come together to make a better community for the children. Mm -hmm. So the, the children have always been at the heart and the center of the organization. Uh, and they started out um, just doing 
simple things back in the days they made doing fish fries and selling dinners and for the first 14 years of the life of their organization it was those women supported by their husbands and their extended families that got together and provided the you know homework assistance the recreational programming community beautification they really made sure that those programs happened if they had to get people to come in and volunteer they did that and then in the 60s, there was some funding put in place, formal funding that the organization received so that it could formalize and structure the programs. And we morphed from doing just youth programming to taking on affordable housing. We have renovated uh, over 25 units of affordable housing. No one in our housing portfolio pays more than 30% of their annual income for rent. Um, and we continue to develop more units. Um, we started a health clinic, uh, which is it initially was OBGYN, but now it's a full uh, primary care clinic. Um, we operated uh, play streets um, for over 68 years where we would shut down the block for the months of July and August and provided structural outdoor recreational programming for young people because as you know, uh, m most folks that are not of economic means can't send their kids away for four or five weeks at camp, and but they need to be out and they need to have safety and 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 recreation. Um, the food pantry started quite some time ago, still doing that. Um, so it's really about making sure that every aspect of that community for that child. Mm is of quality and that it's there and well resourced so that they can grow and thrive so yeah i probably left out a bunch of stuff because there's so much more i'm, I'm kidding you not <laughs> it's so impressive i mean major points it's not it's 2500 huh? units right 20 you said 2500 2, yeah I was like, I want to make sure it's, <laughs> people know it's not 25 apartments. Oh, it's 25? Oh, no. <laughs> 2,500 and more. <laughs> and more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that uh, clarification I, I, there. Five? Oh, my God. Who am I? Yeah. <laughs> Still would have been impressive, but this is, you know. Yeah. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> so... Catherine, talking from like the Broadway community, but also with cloth, I'm trying to see if, you know, already in a community of actors and the writers, everyone who already has a bit of a tough go, not knowing if you're going to have a show mm -hmm. normally, non-pandemic, and then like you were in company, which is so exciting. And congratulations on that. First Thank all. you. <laughs> <laughs> to go from having any show, let alone a show with such high, you know, expectations and everything like that, to then have a pandemic and Broadway shut down for who knows how long. Yeah. Has there been this like sense, I know everyone's talking about the Actors Fund and Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS, but also transferring to other type of organizations and people also needing the help and it being okay that they're accepting help. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> for me, it's really been, um, I'm someone who loves to be busy all the time. Um, I don't do well with empty space in my schedule. I, when, uh, you know, when I was performing eight times a week, I, you only have um, one day off and I would always be performing or at a board meeting or doing something on my day off because I just cannot sit still. Um, and so this kind of really helped me um, in the transition of, oh, it's only going to be two weeks. It's only going to be a month. It's only going to be two months to be like, okay, how can I <clears throat> most effectively uh, spend my time and also feel that I, um, I'm sorry if you keep hearing the sirens, <clears throat> but how can I most effectively spend my time and make sure it's useful um, to what's going on around me. Um, and luckily, you know, being a part of the board, I really get an intel of what's really happening in Washington Heights and 
um, the need that there was. And I already, I knew from the onset of the pandemic that I was like, oh man, it's, it's going to get bad. And um, yeah, I kind of jumped into like, how can I get as many people to know about cloth as possible? Because they're going to need as much help as they can get. Um, and so, yeah, so that's kind of where my energy went <laughs> immediately. Um, and I'm lucky that I am in a fortunate space that, um, you know, maybe around next year, I'll feel a little more, uh, I, I have security at the moment. And so I can focus my attention to people who don't really have um, really anything right now. Um, and so that's kind of what's kept me going and kind of really put everything in perspective for myself yeah. as well, you know? Well, I'm, I'm happy to hear that, that you're able to do both, that you can feel comfortable in your situation and help others and that it's been feeding this other part of you that, that is necessary. I think people don't understand also that artists like need to continue doing art or need to be helping out or giving back in some yeah. way. Right. It's, mm -hmm. it's more than just performing. It's like your way of life. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, this being with them has really just, um, I, I don't know. It's also surprised myself. There's so many things that I was like, I can't do this. I can't do that. And like, oh, I can't, you know, it's provided me an opportunity to really learn about myself amongst everything that has been going on. Oh, he's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. So I'm, I've, 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 I'm very fortunate um, to be able to, you know, work safely from, home to like affect some sort of change. So I feel great. And, and I must jump in and say um, publicly that I am extremely grateful for Catherine and her selflessness um, because sometimes we, we have resources and we don't necessarily share them as we should for the better, you know, for the better good of others. So I, I want to publicly just say thank you. And I, and I love her for her spirit and just her ability to just jump in and see a need and be willing to fulfill the need. That's an awesome thing. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're making me blush. <laughs> I love this. Hey, shout outs are always great. Appreciation. We can never have too much appreciation for one another. And I'm grateful for both of you for coming on the series. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for Thank having me. Thank you. Yeah. You're, you're making me think of a, a famous wicked line for good. Oh, I have been changed for good. So. Very much so. Very, yeah. Definitely. Apropos. The apropos to the situation. <laughs> yeah. So I would love to just take a quick moment and talk a little bit more about your Broadway career and everything you do. Because um, before interviews, I love to take some time. And if you have a YouTube channel, watch your videos or kind of go through your body of work. And your videos are so impressive and well done. And I've just like the the Song of P Purple Summer, that music video. You. <laughs> you are very welcome, very talented, and clearly have this wonderful community that supports you um, as shown in the video and also just through everything you do. So can you, let's just take a moment to talk about, so on Broadway, it's Wicked, Company, and Aladdin. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> quite a three let me tell you um it's kind of it's it's even still being like yeah like I perform on Broadway like that whole sentence still is like hard for me to say um and I've been like doing this for almost like five or six years now which is so crazy um but yeah and like Aladdin and Wicked and Company could not be more different in terms of size, in terms of the type of music, in terms of uh, their themes. Um, and it's definitely what I, like when I envisioned going into this career, I really wanted to do 
so many different types of musicals. I never really wanted to like do the same thing. And so that was, that's just always been really exciting with the three shows that I did. I'm like, they're so different in every way possible. <laughs> They could not be, you know, in the same space. Like, I feel like, you know, Wicked and Aladdin are like complete opposites, but they're so mega, mega shows with, you know, big followings and um, just the sweeping music. And then Company is this just like uh, one of my favorite musicals packed with these incredible stars that I've been looking up to since I was a wee one. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm just, I'm besides myself sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I could only imagine what that must have been like just getting on the stage with Miss Patty Lepone. That could have been pretty, I don't know. No, I mean, we, and we will, uh, we get, we're in a scene with her and ladies who lunch, um, we get to watch her sing it every day on stage, which is, ugh, I mean, how could you, this is like the best thing that could ever happen to me. <laughs> I was like, you sure you want me here because I think my draw will just be on the floor the whole time. <laughs> I cannot wait for the day for Broadway to return and oh so many of us will finally be able to see this epicness. <laughs> yeah. Oh my, and it's coming back. It's coming back. So no, nobody has to worry. We're coming back full steam ahead. So yeah. So talking about all those wonderful roles that you've had, you've met so many wonderful friends along the way. And I'd love to talk about the gala and who's going to be performing and just talk a little bit about it. Yes. So uh, the gala, uh, we have an array of performers um, who are going to be performing, uh, three of which I had done Aladdin with, the first being Damon J. Gillespie, who was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful human being, so vibrant, um, who was in Newsies, he was in Netflix's The Society, he was in Rise, I mean, the man is popping off, doing all the things, so talented, um, and so he's our host for the evening, um, and then James Rowe Iglehart so graciously has lent us his voice. Um, so he's going to be singing a song. And then Ariel Jacobs, who I did Aladdin with as well. Um, she is, her and um, a man by the name of Rogelio Douglas Jr., they both toured in the Heights together. And so they are going to reprise their loving duet um, for us, which I'm so excited, so excited <laughs> about. She sounds amazing and he does too. It's going to be great. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it'll be a lovely evening, and um, we have a documentary that uh, is that was uh, filmed and directed by Quinn Murphy, um, kind of about our, uh, our past, huh? Our history. Yeah, our history, and um, kind of our transition into COVID, and like what we have, even though uh, we're still in this pandemic kind of what we have to look forward to and who has been leading the charge. I feel like um, it's really important for people to know that this was started by black women and that it continues that tradition today. And I, and correct me if I'm wrong, Yvonne, that um, it's 99% or 98% run by women of color. Yeah, you, it's right. interesting. Every morning yeah. we, have a, we have a Zoom um, staff meeting. <clears throat> and, you know, I tease sometimes, though, I, I always hope the men don't take it personally. But there's usually like two of them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the screen is just packed with women of color. Yeah. Uh, wow. yeah so, yes, you are absolutely correct. Yeah. So I think um, it's really great that I feel like we're telling the story of cloth and how it's continued its tradition throughout its 68 years. And then also, you know, honoring the cloth staff members and the team for the hard work that they put in to really turn it around. Um, you know, most organizations could have thrown in the hat and been like, I don't know, this is too much. And um, instead they really, you know, in record time, I feel like really got everything going um, to pretty much back as normal 
as much online or in person as po safely as possible. Um, so yeah, so I feel like it's gonna be a, an uplifting night. And um, we're also honoring um, Melba Wilson of uh, Melba's Restaurant. She's a staple in the community in Harlem. Um, and Andreas Nieto of New York Presbyterian Hospital who created an amazing program over the summer to help um, employees of um, New York Presbyterian Hospital have their uh, kids be employed for the summer. So uh, essentially the, correct me if I'm wrong, Yvonne, mostly like the staff of the hospital, right? So, so, so they really, it wasn't the doctors and the nurses, but they really thought about the security guard and they thought about the clerks and they thought about those, um, la that labor force uh, whose children needed something to do. So the, the, the program they created was geared to that uh, population, which was, which was wonderful. And it's a good way to think about their employees um, so, so that was great. And they also helped to, um, employ another 200 students that were part of CHA, Community Health Academy of the Heights. Yeah. So it was really instrumental there. Yeah. So, yeah. So we're just, um, we're looking forward to an uplifting night and, uh, one that's, you know, celebrating, um, how we were able to handle this transition, but also taking a look at, you know, what the community still needs and what we're going to need. You know, this is, it's not over when the exactly. Exactly. You know? yeah. um, This is gonna be an ongoing process for quite some time. So Agreed. letting people know that this is, you're helping us to sustain and to not forget about us when it's over. <laughs> We still have a long way to go. There's, yeah. there's still a lot of lives we need to, to lift up, a lot of people who still need food and a lot of people who still need comforting, um, you know? So this is, this is we were, were grateful that, that we had the audacity to, to make a change and, um, and continue to pray that we, we keep that strength and people still continue to support us. Uh, so that we can continue to serve those that are really in need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. So where can everyone get their tickets? And if they can't make it, they can still donate. Yes. So you can get your tickets on Eventbrite. If you Google uh, Community League of the Heights, Cloth, Eventbrite, it should be the first link up there. And I can also send it to you. Um, and uh, also you can donate at cloth159.org slash donate um yeah tickets start at 25 dollars, and it's just gonna be a wonderful evening so i hope you can join us all are welcome yes everyone everyone's welcome and um a, a significant portion of the money is going straight back into the community so you don't have it's always it's a constant stream of flow because um you, the help is needed right now, not tomorrow, like now. No. Right. No. Yeah. And it sh the link also is in this YouTube, like the body of the YouTube yeah, page right. for this. Oh, so great. Great. if y'all are watching this now or in the future, you can just find it right there. Or you can always message me if you're like, hey, I have a little question. I'm always happy to forward you to the right place. <laughs> and if I can make a plug, if, if, not just for the gala, but ongoing. If anyone is in a volunteer mood, we take volunteers. Uh, it's a good way to be of service. So feel free to reach out and, and let us know. Volunteer at the food pantry, um, volunteer in, in our efforts with our young people, mentoring and so forth, please feel free. Yeah, yeah. amazing, <laughs> amazing plug. And I, so there's something that I was thinking as, as you were both sharing your stories, but especially Catherine, you saying that when you were growing up and your parents were showing you these different musicals, that the diversity factor was always there. And that's important this year, especially as we've also seen for many years, we've been having the Black Lives Matter movement and everything that's been happening 
uh, in addition to the pandemic, I feel like it has also given people an opportunity to be like, this is happening and you have no other reason to not notice it. Please hear us. Yeah. Uh, can you just like talk about that aspect? Yeah, I think, um, I think Broadway has been going through a slow awakening over time. Um, and I think the, the confines of what this pandemic has done um, has really lifted many issues um, that have taken place within the Broadway community as it regards to Black Lives Matter. And I think um, I'm positive in the direction that it's going. I feel like um, we're really diving deeper into um, what it means besides just having a quota of people on stage or being like, well, this track is always the black track or the Hispanic track or the Asian tracks. So we just have to keep refilling in terms of, there's a broader scope and a broader story that needs to be told. And I am someone who is always of the mindset that a cast should reflect the world of not only this show, but of the world that we are living in. And the world doesn't always, doesn't look the same. <laughs> Nobody looks the same. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm always an advocate of body diversity, of diversity in skin tone and race and um, culture. And I think it only makes, personally, I think it only, um, makes the show better. When you have so many different ideas coming together, um, it really lifts the show in a different way. And um, I think now we're able to really talk about the nuances and really what it means to be a black person um, in theater today and how can we change that for the future and for everyone else in this business um, who's of color. So I'm, 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 I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful <laughs> uh, to what we'll come back to. I'm really excited about the program that um, company is creating um, and inviting people uh, into our process and how we put up a show. And I'm really excited for that. I think they're working with um, the Black Theater Coalition. Yep. Oliver Reed and Warren Adams. So I'm just really excited about um, that coming into play and um, other things that uh, uh, producers and organizations are doing. So yeah, I'm hopeful is my answer. And I've been, I've been um, uh, grateful to work in, pro I mean, being in Aladdin was amazing for me because it was really the first time I was with a, a large uh, group of people from all different cultures and races and um, it was just really inspiring and I do not take that experience for granted at all um, so yeah thank you for sharing yeah. that yeah it's uh, as I've been following the Black Theatre Coalition and all of these other amazing organizations whether new or old or yeah. popping off now with the pandemic and everything uh it's um now is the time, right? There's no Broadway's shut down. Yes. There's if if we don't come back better and more diverse on stage, behind the stage, yeah. the stage hands, the director, the ushers. I mean, like there's just every aspect of it. Yeah. I, yeah. I yes, I think inclusion is is the ticket. I think um sharing ideas and having people really be heard and understood um, is, is, is the way to go <laughs> for the future of the industry. And um, yeah. Yeah. And Eva, <laughs> sorry, it's, it's water time. So <laughs> I hope this hasn't been too distracting for yeah. both of you. Oh, not at all. <laughs> I, you know, I, I live in his world, basically. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm wondering, Yvonne, when the 
the height of the protests in the city, did that affect how, like, were you handing out more water and food? Were there different things happening in that time period? And now, um, you know, there were celebrations over the weekend that, that filled the streets. Like, do these different big cultural moments in our history that we're living through, does cloth kind of reflect, I know you've been adding and ad adjusting to the pandemic, but those specific aspects of it, does that make any difference or you're always just doing so much that it... it, it I, I think we're always, we're always doing, we're always doing it. It's just been for 60 years, it's just been constantly doing. I, I think what is important during those times is the statement we make, is the message that we send out. Um, because we have to, we have to affirm the fact that equality is should be real in our world. It should be practiced in our world. So I think for us, it's making sure that we are talking the right talk and walking the right walk with people and that people see us as an example and that we're setting the example in terms of how we treat people and how we serve people. I think for us, staying on point with that message, staying on point with that um, behavior is what's more important during those times than any other time, but should always be that way anyway. Yeah. But during those times, that's that for us is continue the work, continue the good work, continue the equal work, right? Serve everyone as you would want yourself to be served and just make sure you're messaging to the young people in particular that this world should be fair. You have a place in it. You deserve a place in it. You have a right to have a place in it. You should be respected regardless of what you look like, uh, how you, you, you dress, you have a place in it. So I think for us, it's the messaging and it's the making sure that people understand that um, everyone should be respected for the human being that they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said. Mm. I, I want to just touch quickly upon something you were talking about earlier, Yvonne, that helping the, the kids specifically of the janitors, of the people that, of the, the workers, of the volunteers, people that maybe don't get all the recognition and um, respect that they deserve. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. just so important that you're that we're talking about that and that we're saying, you know, the doctor's amazing for saving them and the nurse is amazing for helping. But also, especially in a pandemic, I feel like, I'm sorry, I've said, especially in a pandemic 50 times today, but ha making sure that the rooms are clean, so important, making sure the kids are taken care of and still having strong mental health. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm trying to even think. Isn't it amazing that it, it's a, it takes a pandemic for us to say that people's work is essential. It's crazy. <laughs> what? What, what do you mean it's not? If, if, I, if I don't feed someone, if, if, if I don't make sure the place is clean, if, if we don't make sure that the, the packages are delivered, if you, that's part of life. All yeah. of it is essential, right? So it always drove me crazy when I would hear people say, oh, they're the essential workers. We are all the essential workers. And if we were to look at ourselves and value the things that we do and see where it fits into the puzzle of life, we would be able to figure that out, that it's not one greater than the other. We all have, you know, I, I, I can't remember who said it, but if you're going to be a sanitation worker, be the best sanitation worker you can be, right? Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that as long as you do it and you do it respectfully and you respect others while you're doing it, right? We are all essential workers. Um, we, our lives are essential. So th that kind of drove me a, a little, it's a little pet peeve, you know, like, yeah. Like, and let's treat everyone for the essential being that they are, right? Which means you're not demeaning anyone, you're respecting them and, and you are acknowledging and recognizing them for what they bring to the table, right? So yeah, we're all essential workers, every single one of us. Couldn't do without the music, couldn't do without the, you know, you know the, the, the restaurants, can't do without the healthcare worker, can't do without the sanitation guy, can't do without it, it's essential. 
I'm preaching. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's always so great. <laughs> I really feel like, I mean, after this is done, I'm just be like, huh, like I feel more at ease with my life. Every time I talk to Yvonne, I feel that way. <laughs> That's how I'm feeling. I feel like I can <sighs> take yeah. a deep breath. Yeah. And it's sometimes it's really important to just hear someone preach when they're so passionate about it because it's true. We we get things done by people being passionate and talking about all those people. Of course, everyone's essential. And those who aren't supporting artists right now, like what are we turning to? We're listening to music. We're listening to podcasts. We're watching videos. We're, mm -hmm. Come on. It's like, you know, everything every aspect of a person is essential and the arts are like, I, <laughs> where would we be without the arts that fill that part of our soul? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. All of those things, all of those things are a, a part of a, a human being. We all have, we may not be able to sing, but we appreciate music. Right. Uh, and we like to hear it. We, we may not be the, 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 medical doctor, but we have empathy and we can feel for others, right? We, we may not be able to, you know, to go to the moon or to do all of that, but we can support those that do. There, there's, you know, all, all of those things are within us. All of those kind of characteristics are within us and none of it should be diminished, no matter what your stature or class or position in life is. You know, so. I agree. I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> Cosine, yes, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. So with the few minutes we have left, I'd love to just hear if there's anything else you came into today wanting to make sure to say. And Yvonne, we'll start with you. And then Catherine, also, if there's any musical things that you want to self-promote, like, please, this is a great time to do both. <laughs> right. Well, I, of course, I'm going to ask everyone to support the organization. Um, that That's a given. But, but I think I think I want to say to everyone that we're going to be OK. We're going to be OK and that we need to have faith. We need to have courage. We need to help each other uh, and, and we need to give respect, respect to time, respect to life. We need to be grateful, get up every morning and thank God for the blessings we have, for the life, for the home, for the family, for the love, for all of that. And I want to thank you very much for allowing us to be with you um, for this hour, hour and a half, whatever it's been. Uh, it's felt very comfortable and very nice. And thank you again, Catherine, for your love and for your championing us through this. That was very nice. Um, <laughs> um, I, you know, I would love for everyone to come to this gala on Thursday. It's at 7 p.m. Again, you can get your ticket at event on Eventbrite. Um, it's going to feature some amazing people. And you're going to also um, learn about an amazing group of people who have been doing not only amazing work during this time, but for the last 68 years. And um, I think they don't get enough credit the amount that they do. And so I'm, I'm excited for people to get to know the, the individual staff members and to really understand the impact that they make um, in Washington Heights. Um, and as always, I'm so grateful to Yvonne and for seeing <laughs> something in me that I necessarily don't see in myself all the time. And also for just, um, always being a constant rock throughout every hurdle um, cloth faces. Um, and COVID is another one of those hurdles and um, just such a brilliant leader that I aim to be one day. Oh, thank you. And yeah, so I hope everyone can come and check us out. Um, if you want, please listen to my music too. It's on Yay. Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I'll also, I'm going to be a part of Paper Mills Sing in the New Year in December, uh, which is going to be really fun. And I have uh, one of my castmates is going to be in it too. Chris Sieber's in it. Um, so that'll be really fun. And Rob McClure, a lot of 
awesome, cool people. Uh, so yeah, so stay tuned for that. And the last thing, um, I also am a part of Sing for Hope, which is a great organization and we do singing telegrams. So if you want something special for your um, family member that's maybe alone during the holiday season, um, I would suggest a singing telegram. It's a very touching way to send a lovely gift. So those are all the things. <laughs> That sounds so lovely. I'm going to definitely check yeah. that out. <laughs> a beautiful way to give a gift. And I'm like always, sometimes I get very emotional at the end. I'm like, I'm glad that this camera is cutting off soon because I don't need to see this, this family doesn't need to see me crying while I'm like singing to their loved ones. <laughs> Um, it's really cool. They 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 also do concerts, um, virtual concerts for nursing homes, and then also for nurses and doctors on their um, breaks in between um, COVID time. Your money is going to you know a really great thing. Yeah, that is fantastic. Can you quickly share where everyone can find you and the organization on social media? Yes, you can find me at Catherine D. Allison on Instagram and Twitter. You can also find me on YouTube. Just type my name in there. I also have a website. Um, free feel, feel free to DM me um, at any time. Cloth, you can find on Instagram and Twitter at Cloth159. Again, Cloth159, super simple. Um, and for those volunteer opportunities, I think you can email info at cloth.org and someone will get in touch with you there. Um, and you can donate on our website at cloth.org slash donate. And yeah, so it's info at cloth159.org. Ah, info at cloth159.org. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's all, right? Yeah, I think yeah. so. <laughs> that's perfect. And y'all can find me at BWA Show. That's B W A Y S H O, as you see here with the banners. And <laughs> I host this YouTube series, but also there's BWA Show, the podcast. Cast, cast. So if that seems like your jam, check it out. And on that note, I thank you both so, so much. This has just been such a rejuvenating hour, and I feel very grateful for both of you for thank coming you. on. Thank so you so much for having us. Thank thank you. Us. We really, 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 really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Yeah. From, the heart. From the heart. <laughs> and thank you all for watching. This has been such a great time, and this interview will remain on forever. So if you missed it, you want to go back to anything, just rewind and check it out. Thanks for watching. We'll see you at the show. Bye, y'all. Bye.